I want to invite you to open your Bibles once again to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, we're looking at what is the central theme in this chapter, Christ crucified. We've been looking through a big section, verses 27 to 54, and should be familiar to us now as we've been kind of working through it week after week. Hopefully you're learning this section. It's an important section because everything in all of time and space and then broader in eternity is centrally pivoting on this moment where Jesus at Calvary 2,000 years ago is suspended, pinned to a cross. My theme has been the idea of reactions to this. Christ crucified initiates four visceral reactions which represent the whole of the human condition. We see kind of the, the span of reactions to Christ then and everyone is reacting to Christ now whether they know it or not. You see that in terms of the perversions of uh, false teachings and reactions to truth, reactions to Christianity, reactions to everything that we stand for in our world. And it's pictured here as reactions to Christ. In verses 27 to 31, they were shaming the Lord. Verses 32 to 36, once Christ is suspended on the cross, they're gaming over his garments, gaming um, the Lord, and then mocking the Lord, as we learned last week, 37 to 44, these mocking provocations to see if Jesus would um, accept a challenge to do some sort of miracle to take him down off the cross, the very thing that would hinder or disqualify him as Savior is what he did not do, shaming, which was the precursor to him going on the cross, gaming while he's on, mocking while he's on the cross, and then that leads us to a fourth point, shaming the Lord, gaming the Lord, mocking the Lord will lead to fearing the Lord. We're going to read about that in the section that we'll cover this morning. There is, by way of context, an increased intensity and recklessness in hate of Christ in this section. But we'll see that verses 45 to 54 turns into a story of redemption, a redeeming story of grace in the midst of chaos and darkness. You have light shining in the hearts of a few soldiers at the foot of the cross. This is, again, a Jewish audience that needed to hear by way of a gospel from Matthew that Jesus, their Messiah, is the king. This conversion story is for Gentile Roman soldiers coming to Christ as a witness to Jews who needed to come to Christ. You might remember your testimony, your story. Maybe it was simple and undetectable as a childhood conversion can be, or it was dramatic and circumstantial, and you can see all kinds of providential push that was happening in circumstances, but your conversion, though it might have been catalyzed from the outside where you were brought to the, a crossroads moment, a decision point of choose Christ or reject, that might have all been happening on the outside, but on the inside, conversion happens as a matter of the heart. Conversion is always from the inside out, not the reverse, though we hear the message from the outside. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Preachers or gospel witness people will say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's what Paul said to the Philippian jailer. All of that comes from the outside, the word coming from the outside. But conversion happens from the inside where God does the radical heart surgery of taking out the heart of stone and putting in a soft heart of flesh. He makes you born again. It's always that way. Dynamic circumstances do become a testimony, though. That's what you'll hear about where people testify in the waters of baptism or if you ask them about their testimony, this was happening, that was happening. Circumstances are, are drawing people to a nexus point in their lives. And Matthew here is really showing the testimony of four soldiers, one centurion in particular who claims Christ as the Son of God. 
Increasing levels of fear are born in the hearts of the centurion and the soldiers as the circumstances are erupting on the outside, leading them ultimately, these soldiers, to accept the Lord and to claim on behalf of Christ who Christ had claimed himself already to be, the Son of God. Let me read our text with that as a background. Verse 45 says now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying Eli Eli lama sabatani that is my God my God why have you forsaken me and some of the bystanders hearing it said this man is calling Elijah and one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. Verse 54 is the end of this section and really the highlight of this section because this is the conversion moment for these who are watching Jesus die. It says the centurion and those who are with him, meaning this sort of guard of four at the base of the cross, They are being converted as Christ dies, they're being brought to life. Christ's death meant life. Mark's account of this pans in closely into the face of the centurion, looking into the face of Jesus. Mark 15, 39 says, When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Centurion and Jesus, Jesus posted probably seven feet high on the cross. The centurion looking into the face of Jesus with all chaos breaking loose around him sees into the face of Jesus something unique and different. The allurement of the world is melting off and the enraptured face of Christ is witnessing to this guard for him to see in the way that Jesus died, in the way that he expired, in the way that he breathed his last breath, that became captivating to him and he was saved. The spokesperson for his party, which was, I believe, saved. John tells us it was four of them. John 19, 23, there were garments that were divided into four parts, one part for each soldier In Matthew 27, 36, the earlier context, they, these four, sat down and kept watch over him there. Roman soldiers had their deepest loyalties, usually to Caesar, to Rome. The centurion would have been a guard, high-ranking soldier over a hundred other men. Gentile soldiers were placed in charge of Jesus execution and this was a high moment for Rome not to drop the ball there was a high threat level that Jesus was dangerous that's why you would have a centurion in charge at this post you'll remember that earlier in the um, shaming passage verses 27 to 31 that the whole battalion verse 27 was gathered 300 soldiers gathered to shame Jesus but they're also watching Jesus they're making sure Jesus doesn't fall through the cracks or there's not some interception by a mass or mob of disciples or perhaps the 12 apostles to create some conspiracy of where Jesus went we don't understand they're watching him closely they recognize that Jesus was powerful he he had done miracles that they could not deny we went over that they weren't even denying the miracles in the mocking phase over Jesus they're saying hey do one more 
but they were sobered by that. You'll remember at the Garden of Gethsemane in John 18, 4, the temple guard was pursuing Jesus in by torchlight and going to get him, but they, they were trying to make out where he was in the band of disciples. And they came forward and Jesus said, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. And then in verse 6 of John 18, it says, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. This is hundreds of soldiers just being swept back by Jesus calling himself, I am. So they understood that they needed to guard him carefully and they put probably their best man on Jesus. Pilate would have given this order. What we first learn in this moment is what, G, what the centurion saw. He saw several things. What did he see? Well, first of all, he saw darkness. He saw pitched darkness. This is the darkness of you can't see your hand in front of your face darkness. This is the darkness of being a, a Boy Scout or whatever at camp. This is my memory of probably the darkest first uh, encounter with super darkness that I saw where there's no natural light. You have your tents, but if there's no flashlight on, you can't see anything and you're running into tent wires. It's dark. That's what this was like. It's the sixth hour, verse 45 says, meaning it's noon in Rome's time um, table. There's going to be darkness, it says, over all the land. There was darkness over all the land for the next three hours until the ninth hour. It was God's doing. Um, noon would have been when the sun is at its brightest, and yet it's completely dark. Some will say this was an anomalous solar eclipse, but that's highly unlikely. I don't think that God was using a solar eclipse. He could have. Solar eclipses usually last seven minutes. This was three hours. It was a supernatural intervention and a sign of judgment. I think I can prove that on, on the basis of Scripture. In the past, when God was judging Egypt, the ninth plague was darkness covering Egypt for three days, Exodus, 20, Exodus 10, 21 through 23. In the future day of the Lord, these same descriptions of what's happening at Jesus' death will be fulfilled in the future at the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13, 10, the stars of the heaven and their heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising. The moon will not shed its light. Joel 2, 10, the earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Amos 5, 18, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, Amos 8, 9. And on that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Revelation 16, 10, also the day of the Lord, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish. Matthew twenty two thirteen 13 is the picture on an eternal scale with judgment in hell, it says, bind them hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. Darkness is a sign of judgment and Christ was absorbing all of hell's eternal judgments for all who would ever reject him or all who would ever believe in him rather. He was absorbing those hell judgment um, judgments unto, unto himself, drinking the full wrath by consequence in that drinking of the wrath of God unto himself on our behalf, darkness was over the entire land. And land here could be translated earth. Was the whole world dark? Probably this is regional darkness. It makes the most sense in the text. We don't know. Spurgeon ponders the question of whether this was the whole world. In 1914, you might Remember a story of Ernest Shackleton who sailed with his crew in the ship called the Endurance to the tip of, from the tip of South America in hopes to dock at Antarctica so they could do a, a foot expedition over the South Pole. 
But if you're familiar with the story, you know that they were stopped early by the ice and they had to stop abruptly at Elephant Island on the way. They didn't make it to Antarctica. They were stuck there and the crew stayed waiting rescue while the smaller vessel under Shackleton went to get help and get a bigger boat. During that time frame, they, the crew that was um, deserted on Elephant Island, lost limbs and, and frostbite and some things that were horrible in description, but what was most horrible to them was what they called the polar night, which means it was always dark in those months. Another account of darkness in our country's history was a disorienting weather event. It was May the 19th, 1780 in the colonial period. At 10 a.m., everything went dark. I looked it up on the internet, so it must be true. There's a lot of historical record to this. Um, it's called the New England's Dark Day. It spanned New England up into Canada. There was um, forest fire smoke and fog came in and just covered everything in darkness. Candles were lit. Joseph Plum Martin, who was a soldier uh, during that time in the Connecticut militia, he commented on it in this way. It said, people on the eastern seaboard noticed a strange haze spreading across the sky. By noon, schools were dismissed, candles lit, torches set in the street, birds went to roost. By one in the afternoon, fear had turned into panic as the premature nightfall continued. Thousands crowded into churches to hear ministers expound the day of judgment. In Hartford, Connecticut, both houses of legislature were meeting. But one of them quickly dismissed since the members thought the world would end at any moment and the other body continued although greatly distressed one man finally motioned to disband since the day of reckoning was thought to have come immediately mr davenport a christian objected saying mr speaker this is either the day of judgment or it is not if it is not there is no need for adjourning if it is i desire to be found doing my work i move that candles be brought in and that we proceed to business the meeting went on um, darkness is disorienting. That's the point. This was abject darkness. And even though it's physical darkness, it is symbolic of something that is a deeper darkness. And that is the, de the depth of darkness in Jesus' own soul. What he felt absorbing the full wrath of God on our behalf. Remember, he had begged God three times at the Garden of Gethsemane, fully God, fully aware of the plan, fully aware of what was why it was necessary and fully committed to go and do that plan. It is asking for the cup of wrath to be passed. This is uh, darkness, but a darkness that turns into the second thing that the centurion saw that moved him. And that was the dereliction of Christ, the abandonment of Christ. That's what dere dereliction means. Desolation could be inserted there. It's the end of three of the most horrible hours ever experienced by anyone. Verse 46 says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli is in Hebrew. It's my God, my God in Hebrew. This is written in, by Matthew's perspective, Hebrew. And then it goes right into Aramaic. Lama Sabatani in Mark's account, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabatani, which is all Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic. This is probably a nod to the Jewish audience just to connect with them. Some say that that use of Eloi, Eloi, um, my God, my God, um, was confusing or garbled because Jesus was disoriented himself in a fogged state or... Um, in his dying state, but I don't think that's the case. He spoke his statements in full strength, it says, with a loud voice, it says in verse 46. He's mustering sincerity and strength and clarity as he's quoting Psalm 22. He's quoting Dave from David's experience. David, who had a far unimaginably, incalculably less experience of pain and desertion or the feeling of that when enemies were bearing down in him wrote of that phrase under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit obviously knowing that this would be applied to Jesus in that moment my God my God which are which are statements of nearness statements of intimacy mixed with the following statement of separation 
Why have you forsaken me? Why is there this um, fracturing in this moment of our relationship? Edmund Hebert says Christ is clinging with trust while feeling completely deserted, which that blend mixed together is Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is David's heart cry of desertion and desperation intermixed with trust. And certainly Jesus knew the context of Psalm 22 that he was quoting. What does it mean that he was forsaken though? John 18, 4 says, Jesus knowing all that would happen to him came forward. He he understood why he was there. He wasn't confused. He didn't have a lapse of judgment or memory. These were foreordained circumstances for Christ. And Christ in his greatest moment of desperation grounds his experience in scripture, which by the way, by way of application, when you're in your deepest, darkest moments, ground them in scripture, cling to truth, cling to scripture. This is why the great hymns are, are great for us to sing in times of great distress because they're so doctrinally bound, scripturally sound. He goes to scripture, Psalm 22, one to five. I'll just quote that as a greater context. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? This is David's testimony. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, and I find, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. Here's the balance, desperation and hope. Yet this is a statement of Christ under judgment, under judgment that he in his life Ministry and obedience did not deserve. He's the most undeserved of this moment. And yet all of the wrath judgment of all of the eternities of hell for all who would ever believe come upon Christ as a curse. And so Christ who is holy is enshrouded with unholiness, with the vileness of, of darkness all over him. And in some mysterious event which we can't explain or fully understand there is a severing in the relationship in that moment where Christ is crying out a cry of dereliction between the father and the son Galatians 3 13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us for it is written curse is everyone who hanged on a tree 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sakes he made him to be sin who knew no sin that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He experienced that so that we didn't have to. He experienced abandonment so we didn't have to. Was God the Father always there with him? Of course, you can't separate the Trinity ontologically in terms of what it is. You can't un-God God. You can't un-God Christ. Did Christ die? Yes. Did God die? No. Did Christ die in his full humanity? Yes. Did Christ die as God? No. Not in the sense that God cannot, he can't die. So how do you put those together? You just say yes to all of it because scripture says yes to these things. Did Christ genuinely ask in his full humanity for the cup of wrath to pass so he wouldn't have to go to the cross? Yes. Did he know the plan all the while? Yes. In hell, will people be forever abandoned by God? Yes, because they're experiencing the full wrath and, and condemnation of their own sin and their own rejection of God in this lifetime. And yet at the same time, Christ will be there executing judgment. These are the tensions of Scripture. The dereliction that Christ is experiencing is him bearing the full weight of hell on your behalf so that you don't have to. Well, that is dereliction. The centurion saw darkness. He saw dereliction. And he also saw derision. Now not participating, 
He's watching mocking going on. Verse 47, and some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Again, the bystanders are trying to provoke Jesus in one last ditch effort to a a show of supernaturalism, some kind of superstition, a superstitious act for him to save himself. This is the draw and allurement of um, sort of hyper supernaturalism that can invade the church as a distraction, as a, as a detour away from the true gospel and the doctrine of Christ. They are not confused. They certainly heard Jesus quoting Psalm 20. They knew their Bibles, but they're saying, is he calling out for Elijah? I guess it's, I guess it's possible that that someone could have heard it that way, but really what they're doing is they are acting like a fool who says in their heart, there is no God. They're acting like the atheist or the agnostic that says, I, you know, I can't understand God. There can't be a God. We're the pinnacle of, uh, existence or nowadays when you hear people talk about existential or universal realities people say there must be higher intelligence but it's not God it's alien intelligence that's where people will go in their minds humanity can't be the pinnacle of things which is all a distortion and a distraction from humans that are made in the image of God that Christ came taking on humanity to die for and the redemption history is being obscured and done away with. That's what they are doing here. Well, he's talking about Elijah. They were familiar with their Old Testaments. They knew Elijah had left uh, by way of a chariot into the sky when the mantle was handed over to Elisha, his mentee. And so they're just saying, well, maybe he'll come back. In fact, let's run and Jesus had said, I thirst, let's run and get him some wine on a sponge. This is a second event, not the wine and gall to numb his pain, but let's get him some wine to refresh him, to keep him energized so he can perform this trick for us and summon from the heavens Elijah to rescue him. We want to see this. And they believed he could do it. That's what they were doing, but they were trying to disqualify him, to discredit Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this, I thought this was interesting. It's always, he says, it always seems to me very remarkable that the sponge, which is the various, very lowest form of animal life, should have been brought into contact with Christ, who is at the top of all life. As the sponge brought refreshment to the lips of our dying Lord, so may, so may the least of God's living ones help to refresh him now that he has ascended from the cross to the throne. Jesus said he was thirsty and he was fulfilling prophecy, John 18, 28. But this was no move of mercy for the Lord. They were mocking him. Though Christ died of natural causes and blood loss and asphyxiation, meaning he died drowning, in his own lungs, which were filling with fluid, unable to get oxygen, it's important to establish that Christ with full cognizance let himself go. And that leads us to our next point, which is deliverance, verse 50. It says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Again, a loud voice, it's repeated here, verse 46, with a loud voice, and 50, with a loud voice, he's mustering all his remaining strength. It's amazing to think, one who was eviscerated, one who was um, just completely, um, just brutalized on the cross, unrecognizable even as to who he was based on Isaiah 53, He musters strength, and in John 19, 30, it says, when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, to telestai. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus, at this point in time, knew, and I want you to hear this, he knew that redemption had been accomplished and applied to everyone who would believe. 
Um, the cross is not something that is in and of itself only an open invitation for the world to believe. It is. Uh, whosoever will, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is going to not cast anyone out who comes to him freely and openly to this offer of the gospel. But the atoning work of Christ is accomplished for everyone who would believe up to the point of the cross and post hints of the cross, looking back to the cross. Everyone who would ever believe, those are the ones for whom Christ applies the atonement to. If the atonement is applied to everyone in the world of all time, and then they have to undo it in unbelief, you really are more like a universalist. The atonement is applied Christ died for his church. He laid down his life for the sheep, John 10 says. He knew what he was doing. It's why he said to Telestai, this is what captivated the centurion's attention where you have earthquakes happening. You have rocks splitting. You have reports of the temple breaking apart. You will have resurrected saints walking around and this centurion with all of this chaotic darkness and cataclysmic events happening around him is looking into the face of Jesus and seeing darkness, dereliction, derision with mockers. And then this statement, this triumphal statement of deliverance to Telestai, it's captivating the heart of the centurion. He's seeing that Christ is in control of the exact timing of his own death. In Mark's gospel, again, in 15, verse, chapter 15, verse 37, Jesus breathed his last. He saw how Jesus literally expired with his final breath. He gave himself away. D. Edmund Hebert said his death came voluntarily. He refused to use his miraculous power to fend off death. Some claim Satan killed Christ. We know that's not true. This wasn't some cosmic boxing match where Jesus lost in the 12th round. Satan had the allowance to bruise the heel of Christ, Genesis 3.15, where Adam and Eve are being cursed for their sin. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is for all of mankind. And between your offspring and her offspring, there's enmity. Satan is the sworn enemy of Christ. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This was to the serpent. Satan's head ultimately is crushed, but it was crushed by Christ under Christ's sovereign dominion to do that. John 10, 18, no one takes it from me, meaning his life, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my father. When Christ died on the cross, this was the death blow to Satan. John 15, 13, this is also the great act of love for saving Believers, greater love is no one man than no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid his life down for you in friendship. John, first John three sixteen. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This leads us to our final portion of the text, dominance. You have darkness, dereliction, derision, deliverance, and dominance. Verse fifty one. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook and the rocks were split. Stop there. The tearing here was supernatural. There were two curtains, one of the outer court and then one to bring you to the near court. And the, you know, the curtain, I don't know the exact measurements of thickness. I think three feet thick maybe. But just think in terms of this pulpit. You're not able to tear a curtain like that by natural means like an earthquake, uh, especially top to bottom. This was a supernatural poignant tearing from top to bottom to make a statement, a statement that uh, was deliberate, precise, substantial. This wall-like fabric was being torn by God. It was God's barrier between the outer court of the Holy of Holies into the inner sanctum. And once a year at Yom Kippur, the high priest would be allowed 
and designated to go into the inner sanctum to offer the sacrifice um, to God. And if he did it in an irreverent way, would be immediately struck dead for doing it the wrong way to picture again the holiness of God. So what things are noted by this in terms of the tearing of the curtain well first God did it this way to say that the sacrificial system had been fulfilled by the once for all sacrifice of Christ secondly the corruption that had come into the system was shut down and thirdly believers now have immediate instant access to God in the holy of holies through Christ Hebrews 10, 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. We have a great high priest over the house of God. We're able to draw near to God with a true heart of full assurance, a conscience sprinkled clean by the blood of Christ what about the resurrected saints that are mentioned here in verse 52? I want to mention that real quickly. Who were they? There's only the mention of them here in Matthew. It says, the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Who were they? Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went to the holy city and appeared to many. So they went to Jerusalem. They walked around physically. What were they doing? We can only speculate. No, there's no other mention of this in Mark, Luke, or John, or anywhere else. We shouldn't underestimate the power of Jesus' death to say that this wouldn't have happened. Of course this happened. It's a picture and symbol of the meaning of the cross. I have to say that the fact that saints of old, meaning those who died before Christ came, those who fell asleep, meaning they died, but they died in faith, those were reliant also upon Jesus' death. So all the saints, all the Old Testament saints, all the heroes of the faith from Hebrews 11, they were all looking to a Messiah with a faith that is like substance to them. They, they concretely believed in Jesus. They were looking to him substantively, and they might not have understood exactly how Jesus was going to do it as Messiah with the cross. They had to understand at some level that he would be pierced, that he'd be raised up and lifted up. He's the lamb that's mentioned in Isaiah 53. So they're looking for him. And their salvation was as dependent upon Jesus' death as our salvation post the cross is dependent upon Jesus' death. That's the point. It covered both ends of the spectrum. And so for them to show up and there to be a, an appearance and a representation of this makes all the sense in the world. Was this a two-stage event where the rocks uh, are splitting up and earthquakes are happening in the earth and they are raised and resurrected, but they don't come out of their grave until Christ's resurrection, verse 53? I don't see it as a two-stage event. Some people do. I think it was when Christ was raised and came out of his grave, the others came out of their graves. Jews were buried in graves. They were buried in sepulchers. They were buried above ground, and they walked right out at the resurrection. And what's amazing to me is to think about them as those who are clinging to the promise of Jesus, who actually had the opportunity to walk around physically with Christ. You say, it's amazing that they were able to do that, to look to Jesus whom they had ne never seen. Well, guess what? We're exactly like them, retrospectively looking back to Christ whom we've never seen, looking forward to Christ whom we've never seen. And we one day, like them, will walk around with Jesus in the physical reality of the new heavens and new earth, just like they were able to, privileged to do so. Hebrews 11, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That's verse 1. For by it, the people of old received their commendation by faith. We understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's this substance that is held on to. Verse 13 goes on. These all died in faith. I'm talking about Moses, Abraham, Sarah, Ruth, uh, the heroes of the faith. They all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles in the earth. They had the substance of faith, just like we do, greeting things from afar. We look future. They were looking future. 
but they found um, Christ, some of these saints did, at the resurrection. And we too will find Christ at our resurrection. This leads us back to where we began. Verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, this is the party of four soldiers, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they, meaning all of them are being converted here, were filled with awe and said, truly, truly is the word amen. Truly, this was the Son of God. They're saying what the Father said over Jesus at baptism. This is the son of God. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. The demons said it in the temple, not with saving faith, but they're going, this is the son of God. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the Gentile centurion who's standing up for Christ. All the chaos and darkness happening on the outside, irrelevant. What's happening on the inside, relevant. He's born again, they with him, his friends, born again, relevant. It's what's happening to him in time and space. I'm seeing Christ. I'm seeing the Messiah. The world's coming apart, but something beautiful and divine is happening in front of me. Jesus died before his eyes in strength and in weakness. He was seeing the God-man, the divine congruence. Soldier's darkened heart was dawning with new life. He didn't understand all that was happening and the significance there. We know now that there's so much that was going on at the cross. John Gill, the English pastor scholar of the 1700s, put it this way. The whole will of God that he should be incarnate, be exposed to shame and reproach and suffer much and die. The whole work his father gave him to do, which was to preach the gospel, work miracles and obtain eternal salvation for his people, all which were done. Now done or as good as done, the whole righteousness of the law was fulfilled and the penalty of death endured the redemption from its curse and condemnation secured. Sin was made an end of full atonement and satisfaction for it were given complete pardon procured peace made and the redemption from all iniquity obtained. All enemies were conquered. All types, promises and prophecies were fulfilled and his own course of life ended and the reason of his saying so was because all this was near being done just upon finishing and was as good as done and was as sure and certain and so complete that nothing need or could be added to it. This is the son of God who came not to save through conquest, but through suffering. The light had dawned in the heart of the centurion. Has the light dawned in your heart? Second Peter 1.19. Has the morning star of belief and faith, has that risen in your hearts? Nobody wants to stay in darkness. Jesus hung there in darkness in the cro on the cross so that you could come to the light. Have you come to the light of Jesus have you believed and said, where else have we to go? You alone have the words of what? Eternal life. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus like these soldiers did? You should. This is the witness for you to believe in him as the son of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for the witness of your word, for the truth therein. We praise you that you are not dead on a cross, but you are the risen Lord and you've risen in our hearts um, as we have believed in you. Lord, I pray that we would go out into the world and we would offer this message in the way we live, that they would witness the silent witness of Christ in our life and the witness that speaks through the words we say or do not say and the way that we hold out the truth so that people can be made free. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.